lifting up collegiate ministry, campus ministry as essential and as an important component of our cooperative program support. Now it's time for me to give you a, the report that I alluded to this morning as I was struggling to prepare this report. My wife said, Augie, don't you think you ought to tell everybody that you're not a pastor and just a layman? I said, well, <clears throat> I think they will have figured that out after I gave my first report, so I don't need to be any more uh, open about it. But I would appreciate you praying for me uh, and praying with me now that what I'm about to share, which will include some detail, uh, would touch your heart in the way God would want it touched and that anything I would say that he would wish not be heard or does not have merit that uh, you would ignore or he would somehow cover or make right. Would you pray with me real quick? Dearly Father, we are a people who want to obey you and we want to do it better and better and better. We don't want to sit on a course of performance that is habitual, automatic. We'd rather be responsive to your leadership. Help us to look at ourselves with your eyes to act as you would wish for us to. Lord, I pray selfishly that the report I'm about to give you now, uh, for you now, to these people, not mislead them, not be defeating, but would encourage them. As I have been encouraged and if others have been encouraged through the works and ministries of this great convention. So we pray now for this report. We pray for our convention. We pray for its churches. We pray that we would bring glory to you in every way possible. We want to direct people to you so they can find you, find the path to heaven, and enjoy the benefits of the life that you offer, that abundant life that John 10.10 10 talks about. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And thank you for praying with me. At the outset, let me say a quick word about all the things being discussed recently about us in the press and in the anti-social media. I'm aware of all those things. Who could not be? But I have decided not to address any of them specifically. I will only say this. Any broad brush characterizations saying that all of us approve and accept all of the actions of some of us are always unjustified, untrue, and quite frankly, ridiculous. But I can think of a description of all Southern Baptists that is absolutely true without question. We acknowledge that every single one of us is a sinner, and because of that, we need Jesus. As I mentioned this morning, in this portion of your executive committee's report, I will first cover our ongoing work, I will provide some vital convention statistics, and then toward the end, I will discuss some of the greater challenges the SBC presently faces. Let me begin by talking to you about current leadership and transition. As I am sure most of you are aware, a little over two months ago, we experienced the unexpected departure of our executive committee's president. Our chairman, from whom you heard this morning, responded in a timely fashion and in accordance with our bylaws to call a special meeting of our board on April 17th. During that meeting, among other things, a search committee for our next president was selected. That special meeting was a testimony to me. I can safely say that the way it was conducted and the way the members stepped up in such great numbers to attend on short notice and the way they then voiced their various and differing opinions and the way they deliberated and the way they prayed all along the way at every step and then the way they reached their consensus decisions all taken together painted an excellent picture of how business should be conducted in a Christian context. I was very proud of them all and I give glory to God for the spirit of that meeting. Just know this, your executive committee is committed and unified in its sense of duty to you and to your churches. And its staff, which I have the honor of temporarily leading, is extremely proud to serve a board like we have. Thank you for electing those fine men and women to serve as your executive committee. 
Now, our presidential search committee, shown in this photo, is composed of six, I'm sorry, composed of seven members now, due to an election yesterday. This slide lists who they are and where they serve. I'll not read the slide. I'll leave it there for a moment for your review. Beside the spirit of that special called meeting that I just mentioned a moment ago, the composition of this committee is yet another blessing. Its members were nominated from the floor and chosen by a vote of the entire executive committee, thus indicating that they all have individually distinguished themselves and earned the trust needed to perform the important task of presidential recommendation. And the search committee is diverse. It contains both genders. It has a healthy ethnic component, and it includes two nationalities, American and Texan. Now, they have already begun their work, as our EC chairman will mention something about that, or has already mentioned something about that in the work that he described this morning. From an operational standpoint, I can report to you that our work is continuing in a normal manner. Our change in leadership is not going to result in a change of direction, not at all. Our goal is to continue serving the churches of the Southern Baptist Convention in a trustworthy and God-honoring way. And I see no reason we cannot achieve that goal by performing well all of the assignments that you have given to us. Let's move on now to the state of health of our convention. Over the years, when we have sought to measure or describe our condition, we have gotten into the habit of using a fairly small set of handy indicators. Those indicators have been cooperative program contribution totals and percentages, the number of Southern Baptists, the number of Southern Baptist churches, the number of baptisms in the most recent year, the number of missionaries we have on foreign fields, the combined graduate count of our seminaries. If you think the list is not stated in a proper priority, I would agree with you wholeheartedly. But I didn't list them in the order of their importance. I listed them in the order of my perception about how frequently they are used in our printed materials, in our public statements, and in our everyday Baptist conversations. I could be wrong. You might have heard these measurements in a different order of frequency, but I think we would all agree that whatever the ranking, these are the numbers we hear most often. Let's look at our current numbers in these categories and in the order I presented them. First, in regard to the cooperative program, this last year, for the second time in two years and for the and for only the fourth time in the entire history of the cooperative program, our state conventions cumulatively forwarded more than 40% on to the SBC for its missions and ministry causes. Even better, altogether, the states set a new high of 41.49% for the SBC's part of the CP division. I will discuss some additional ramifications of those state convention decisions in a minute, but let's look at what they added up to. Last year, we received and distributed to our entities, <clears throat> lost my place. Last year, we, just, we received and delivered to our SBC entities um, more than 40%. And we distributed to them more than $197 million from our portion of the cooperative program. Now, what I want you to understand is that when I say our portion of the cooperative program, I'm talking about the national part of it. You're at the national annual meeting. If you study pages five and six in your book of reports, you will see that not only is that amount more than we received the previous year, but it is more than we have received in the most recent six years. And that's as far back as that report feature goes, always, six years back. Two weeks ago, LifeWay released the numbers from our most recent annual church profile report from the churches. The number of Southern Baptists is still very high and significant. It's just over 15 million. The number of cooperating churches seems large and healthy, more than 47,500. And the number of baptisms, while still declining, was slightly more than a quarter of a million. I was disappointed, as I know you are, that our baptism numbers continue to decline, although for the first time since 2009, worship attendance grew slightly. It, it grew from 5.2 to 5.32 million. With regard to the number of missionaries, NAM has reported in your book of reports 5,200 missionaries, and the IMB reports having more than 3,500 missionaries serving overseas. And all six of our seminaries are ranked among the top 10 in the nation. 
These figures are not only among the very best among other evangelical groups, but they're really outstanding when compared to them. And while all of those things are true, and while you have come to expect our reports to be positive and to be upbeat, I think it is important that we not overlook the whole picture. Let me use an analogy to give you a more complete report, a report that includes some facts that we may be overlooking. I do want my report to be encouraging to you, but I also want it to cast a true picture so we can be inspired to reach greater heights. While I do see the need to encourage us about where we are, I think we need to understand our actual position. If we see the whole picture, I think it will do a better job of motivating us to be who we should be and a better job of steering us to where we should go. This morning, I referred to the SBC as a very large ship, one that is certainly seaworthy and one that has all the amenities its passengers might wish for, a ship that is solid a ship that is well constructed, but one that may at times turn more slowly than we might wish so that it can remain stable. Now let's stick with that analogy. You know, Adrian Rogers once said that it is not good practice to convey any sense of a sinking ship because when you do that, no one tries to stay on it. Everybody jumps overboard. Well, the first thing I want you to know is that the SBC is certainly not a sinking ship. It may be a ship that is showing signs of age. It may even need some repair. But the need for maintenance is a normal thing. And all in all, down through the years, our ship has been maintained fairly well. But some have wondered whether our ship might be adrift. It appears to lack the power needed to forge through larger waves or proceed through seasonal storms. And if it cannot do those things, it cannot reach its destination. It needs the power of God. If we really look at all of our vital statistics, they tell us that we may have been concentrating on what or where the ship is rather than where it should be going and what it should be doing. Let me first justify my statement about our ship's maintenance and then I will discuss what I believe to be the cause of our loss of propulsion. I think it could be said that our ship may be showing age, but it is still in seaworthy shape. As for total CP, state and national, we still receive from our churches about a billion dollars every 26 to 28 months to support our state and national missions and ministries. Yes, I said a billion. We are still the largest evangelical body in America, numbering over 15 million congregants. We still serve more than 47,000 churches that meet every Sunday and that faithfully preach sound doctrine. We still are deploying the largest fully funded evangelical mission force to tell the world about Jesus. The ship has an excellent compass and rudder. The Bible and our statement of faith, the Baptist faith and message. Its decks are sound. What are those decks? Well, the decks include local churches, associations, state conventions, and the national convention. Each deck has plenty of quarters in which may be found all sorts of fellowships and subgroups ethnic, age-bracketed, interest-oriented, you name it. The ship has a good array of services and programs to enlist, equip, and deploy people on mission. Its communications are in good shape. SBC Net, Baptist Press, SBC Life, state papers, and a vast array of blogs, podcasts, and other social media platforms devoted to things of interest to Southern Baptists. Its various crew members and bridge officers are all capable and they are all undertaking their appointed tasks. And it's amenities. My, how they shine. Everything we need is on board. Everything is available, everything. Our problem in the SBC has never been a lack of worthy resources. We have so many that it may be difficult to quickly find the particular one we're looking for at that moment, but a lack of tools and helps is not our problem. Our ship, our great ship, with all of these good attributes, seems to be adrift. While the marvelous work of many on board is admirable, and I mean that, their efforts alone are not enough for the ship as a whole to pass muster. Could it be that we are not underway because we are not under power? Maybe we have thought everything was good because we have been looking at the wrong gauges on the bridge of the ship. 
Or maybe we have been misinterpreting the readings of those gauges. Maybe we have come to understand something even bigger or to misunderstand something even bigger. Maybe we have forgotten who we are and what we should be doing. Maybe we have gotten used to the pleasures of being a passenger. Maybe we have come to think that we are on this kind of ship, a ship with all those amenities I mentioned a bit ago, a ship that has everything we need, a ship that serves us well, a ship that is comfortable and safe and work and worry-free, when actually we once understood that our ship was more like this, a ship designed for hard work, a ship with no tourists and only a well-trained crew, a ship equipped not for pleasure but for productivity, a ship that has everything others need and desperately need. Did you read the papers a couple of days ago about the increasing rate of suicide in our nation? People are lost, they're dying, they have no hope, and they need the gospel message. Our office where your executive committee staff works in Nashville is assigned the task of cooperative program promotion. Now, as for the gauges on those ships, on that ship that I described, as for the gauges on the bridge of that ship, I think we actually have been misreading those gauges. Perhaps we not, have not been reading all of those gauges. I want us to look again, and we want to start with the cooperative program gauge. In doing that work with the cooperative program that I described a minute ago that our office undertakes, we regularly report what we receive. And as I said earlier, our receipts have been improving. And what we receive does not tell the whole story of the cooperative program. We cannot forget that missions and ministries at the state level depend on the cooperative program too. If you will excuse the analogy abuse, we cannot really assess the health of the whole ship without looking at state work or we will miss the boat. So let's look at the whole picture. This first chart in the bottom graph indicates what our office, the national office, the SBC office, received through the cooperative program from 2000 to about 2008, just before the economic downturn. Above that, you can see a graph of the total amount received through the cooperative program, state and national combined, everything. As you can see, the graphs appear to be in direct relationship with both of them ascending. Now let's bring those graphs up to date to include the last 10 years. As you can see in the bottom graph line, what we at the national level received took a dip at first, but then it recovered quite nicely. What you can also see by looking at the top graph line is that our total cooperative program giving has continued to decline. Let's look at another gauge to assess what is going on with cooperative program giving. This chart includes the ACP figures that have just been released. It shows the average CP percentage given by the local churches has declined at an alarming rate from about 5.5% in 2013 to the 4.86% just reported. But it also shows the gauge that we've had a habit of focusing on, the gauge that shows the percentage the SBC receives from the states. And it shows that that gauge has been improving markedly and misleadingly. How could this be? The actual numbers show how it could be. So look at this spreadsheet. I know you cannot see all of those numbers right now. We're going to come back to it in a minute. What this chart shows is that at the national level, our ministries were the beneficiaries of voluntary ministry sacrifices made by the states. Now, to their credit, last fall, Alabama became the sixth state convention to adopt at least a 50-50 split in CP gifts for state and national ministries. They joined Iowa, Nevada, and Ohio at 50-50. Florida is at 51-49, and the Southern Baptist of Texas convention is at the split of 55-45, the highest split benefiting the national body. SBC Virginia is right up there with a 51-49 split, less shared ministry costs. We owe the state conventions a tremendous debt of gratitude for all they have done while still, still carrying on their work in church planting, evangelism, education, benevolence ministries, church health and remediation, church revitalization, collegiate ministries about which you just heard, disaster relief, and a host of other missions initiatives in their respective states. 
We should certainly applaud and otherwise greatly honor the voluntary sacrifice of the state conventions, but our more complete understanding of the CP gauge now brings us to the realization that in the last 18 years, though our national ministry receipts have improved by just over $17 million, our state ministry support has shrunk by over $41 million. And the cooperative program, how has it fared? Our total cooperative program receipts have declined by $13.5 million. What should we take away from all this? I believe we can take away that Southern Baptists are a sacrificial people, that we are willing to try to do more with less, but I also think we need to understand that while national ministries are being well-funded, state ministries are not, and our total CP giving is not doing well at all. As I've been discussing with you how to read and better understand what I have called the CP gauge, I have said a whole lot about the state conventions and their plight why would I report anything about the trials of other smaller conventions? Well, because, ladies and gentlemen, they are us. Their ministries are our ministries. A friend of mine who is the executive director of the Oklahoma Convention, Hans Dilbeck, said it best. He said the states send more than their money. They send their prayers and their people. And that's always been true, always. The cooperative program is not a big deal because it only supports big national entities like our mission boards and our seminaries and the others I referred to this morning. It is a big deal because it plays such a large part in all Southern Baptist ministry across the board, both state and national. Our domestic base must be supported. And much of that work is done most effectively at the state level. Dr. Ezell cannot lead NAM to do all church planting by itself. College campuses must have a strong evangelical presence. The vital works of children's homes and elder residences must be sustained. Church revitalization must occur. And the most important work, the most important work, evangelism, it must. It must be abundantly provided for. And we all know that evangelism begins at the local level and is best resourced through statewide assistance and strategies. While you absorb all that, I want to voice how it came to be that we use the cooperative program as a primary metric. There's a really good reason we fell into that habit. It is because we Southern Baptists have never thought of it as money. We have always thought of the cooperative program as conversions. I love that about us. That is why I'm a Southern Baptist. We believe the Bible, and that means that we believe in a real heaven, a real hell, and a real savior. We are always willing to spend our money on missions and ministries as long as those missions and ministries contain a backbone of evangelism and soul winning. For us, dollars spent must result, and they will result, in evangelism and baptisms. And that is why we cite CP and the other simple metrics that we do. It is because we presume that those metrics indicate how well we are doing at leading people to Christ. So let's look at those simple metrics again. What about the number of Southern Baptists? Are we reaching new highs there? What about the number of churches? What about the number of missionaries at home and abroad? What about our baptism count? What about our seminary output? I think you know the answer to all of those questions. With precious few exceptions, those metrics have either plateaued or declined. Now our good ship our very large, structurally stable, and well-equipped, and yes, comfortable ship seems to be adrift. Why is that? It's because we have no power. And why is that? Well, it is not because we have not rolled out year after year a new program or produced another task force. Those things have their place, but they are accessories, not essentials. It is not because our doctrine, our talent, our leadership, or any other aspect of the maintenance of our ship is grossly deficient. Maintenance is important, and there are errors and failures to be repaired along the way, but maintenance is not an end in itself. And it is not because we have no engine. The Holy Spirit is within us. He is alive. He's ready to work in us and through us, but we are somehow quenching His power. And we are commanded in Scripture not to do that. We have quenched the fire of the indwelling Holy Spirit. We need ignition to obtain power. 
And we can turn that ignition switch on through repentance and obedience, mine and yours. Through obedience, we can release the power of God in and through us. We desperately need his power. We really have none of our own. Examine this passage with, with me. Look at verse 30, right there in the middle. You see that big, bold verse? Look at the subject matter that that middle comment is nested within. Isn't this passage pointing directly at one way, just one way, that we may be presently grieving, quenching the Holy Spirit? If you think so, like I do, you will agree with me that we need to repent from doing these things. We, each one, one by one, need to do our part. I have always been one of those Southern Baptist laymen who have had faith in God, faith in the organization, faith in the leadership, faith in the cooperative program, still do. I've always loved the Southern Baptist Convention being the best, I still think it is. But I must admit to myself that often what I was admiring was what others were doing. Well, I just looked on as a tourist on a cruise enjoying the scenery. So fellow lay people, I want to say something on behalf of your pastor. I want to say something on behalf of your church staff. They cannot be the church all by themselves. They cannot do all the witnessing. They cannot do all the discipling. They cannot do all of the ministry. I do not see anywhere in scripture the idea that the New Testament church had to hire more ministers so they could tell more people about Jesus. Lay people, we are the church every bit as much as the staff. Now, isn't it great that God made every one of us a member of the crew on this ship of ours? We are told in Philippians 2.13 that he lives in us and he works through us. Passages in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 teach us that it is all of us working together and each one of us doing our individual part. Only by being obedient to our individual calling can we get started, which will then allow God's power to work in and through all of us as a unit, trained, ready, each one at his or her assigned task on board the ship. Now, if we are willing to do that, if we are willing to each one be obedient, or even to just take the next step of obedience, only then will the ship's rudder of sound doctrine steer us correctly to the destination God desires. Only then will the Holy Spirit, unquenched, provide us with maximum propulsion. Only then will we see what God's power will produce. Now, if any of this analogy seems a worthy way of looking at our convention, I can think of two things in the area of obedience that we need to start with to bring our ship back under full power. Two very important things we used to do better and two very simple things. We can witness and we can tithe. Our theme for this meeting is all about the first thing, testifying. If each Southern Baptist won just one person to the Lord this year, just one, next year our baptism count would certainly set a record, but more importantly, over 15 million people would not suffer hell. I will talk more about witnessing in a minute because I want to end on that most important thing, telling others about Jesus at every opportunity. As for tithing, yes, I said it was simple. I didn't mean that it might not put some of us under an economic strain. What I meant was merely that it is simple to know what to do and to determine if we are doing it. All it takes is for each of us to move the decimal point in our salary figure one place to the left. Now we're in Texas. Texans talk plainly. So let's talk Texan. Tithing means tenth. If we're not bringing a tenth of our income to the church storehouse in obedience to God, we are not tithing, period. And the way I read scripture, tithing appears to be only a starting point, not a compliance maximum. In Luke 21, Jesus commended a woman who gave 100%. In three chapters earlier, he refused to commend a man who claimed to always give 10%. So the right figure has to be somewhere in the middle. Maybe because I'm a layman, I don't understand all I should have asked scripture. But I have confidence that God will honor my tithing if I am doing it in an honest attempt to better obey him. Some might think Malachi 3, 8 through 12 and Matthew 23, 23 don't apply anymore. If they think that, then the Lord can decide between us. I do not mean to be self-righteous. My tithing may be a habit, but habits do not make people righteous. 
being washed in the blood of the Lamb does, a real relationship with Jesus does. Now, I have not forgotten that I'm supposed to be bringing a report to you about the SBC's condition and about its production. So what does tithing have to do with that? Well, here's how it applies. Multiple studies reveal that if those of us who earn a wage simply tithed and did nothing more, our CP receipts would quintuple. Can you imagine if we just tithed and did nothing more? And we are commanded to do more. We could afford five times the number of missionaries at home. We could support five times the number of missionaries abroad. Maybe have five times the number of college ministries to reach and strengthen students. Perhaps a similar increase in the number of our seminary graduates. By any estimate, we could certainly expect a gigantic increase in all of our present fruit. In all of it. And if it resulted in five times the number of converts, I could live with that, couldn't you? I know they could live with it. They could live with it eternally. And all of that improvement would come from just one simple act of obedience. Tithing. It would not even involve improving the average percentage our churches give to the cooperative program. Although if that happened too, it would carry us to even greater heights of effectiveness in ministry. Now in the last few minutes of our report, I want to make the connection between that other act of obedience I mentioned. Witnessing, testifying, and our leverage stewardship program. You've already heard Dave Ramsey talk about the leverage program that the executive committee is sponsoring. And I hope you heard that Dave is sponsoring it with us, matching our subsidy dollar for dollar, which we very much appreciate. That program has three components. You've heard about the first two. Dave talked about disrupting the norm. Dr. Gaines has often talked about advancing the gospel. And now what I want to tell you about is the third component of leverage, seizing the moment. You know, to wrap my mind around something, I always need to think of it in my own shorthand terms. I think of Dave's part as helping us to get free. If one is going to run a race or do any sort of endeavor, he has to be untethered. He has to be unshackled. He can't be handcuffed. He must be free. If we are going to serve the Lord be available to him, we have to be freed up to do that. And if all we can think about and worry over is how we're going to pay the bills or feed and shelter our family or conduct our schedules or craft our waking time, we're not going to be at God's disposal. And neither will our financial resources. Why? Because we won't have any. For those reasons, I think of Dave Ramsey's part, the first part, as the get-free part. The part Dr. Gaines always speaks about, that part of advancing the gospel, is the centerpiece of the leverage program. It is the reason we need to be good stewards. If we forget that reason, we run the risk of only becoming good money managers who never testify to others about Jesus. I will call that middle part the get-focused part. Our object in getting free is not to feather our own nests or heap up worldly wealth. Our goal is to win the world to Christ. We must get focused on God's purpose for our, for our being good stewards. Now, the third part, the part I want to close with, has to do with seizing the moment. One must do all three things to serve well. He must get free to serve. He must get focused, or as one of our pastors has famously said, he must be purpose-driven. And finally, he must be ready to instantly respond to opportunities because those opportunities evaporate quickly. I think of this third part as the get-going part. What holds us back from telling others about Jesus? Is it fear that we won't have an answer to all their questions? Is it not knowing when or how to start? Is it the lack of preparation or of our having a plan? If we're really honest with ourselves, it may just boil down to a lack of trust. Whatever it is, God has everything handled. He has all the answers we need. He knows when just the right time is to testify. He will give you the words to start. He has the plan. It is not as hard as the devil wants you to think it is. I once attended a meeting where the California State Convention's executive director, Fermin Whitaker, promised that when he spoke during the last session, he would share with everyone what he had discovered to be the very most effective witnessing strategy ever. Everyone stayed until the end to learn about it. And when he revealed it, he explained what it was using only three words. He said, open your mouth. He directed the attendees to Ephesians 619. He explained that God just asks us to trust him and be obedient. 
God just asks us to be at his disposal, to be ready. He will take care of everything else. As the verse says, God will tell us what to say. Now, is it really as simple as that? Does the devil have us all buffaloed about something that is really so simple? Yes, yes, he does. Or at least he seems to. And yes, it is really that simple. Let me give you some examples. I can remember a time when a lot of Southern Baptists commonly used a witnessing plan that sounded something like this. Hey, neighbor, next Sunday is fill a pew Sunday. Will you help me fill mine? Afterwards, we can go to lunch. I'll buy. That's the plan. Simple, right? Of course, you'll have to get free to be able to pay for the lunch. You'll have to get focused to stay on track and remember that your neighbor's eternal destiny is on the line. But this is certainly one way the Southern Baptists used to get going. To get going, to be ready to testify, takes nothing more than valuing and listening to the Lord's leading. Praying and then listening to God. Valuing his direction. I once heard a story about a rural farmer who was taken on his first trip to New York. And amidst the hustle and bustle of the big city, his host and guide noticed a huge smile on the farmer's face. And he asked him, why are you smiling? The farmer said, oh, I just heard a friendly sound. I heard a cricket chirping. His host snorted and said, how in the world did you hear that above all the noise? And the farmer said, well, it's all about what you're listening for. People listen for what they value. Here, let me show you. And to make his point, he threw a few coins on the ground, and despite all of the traffic noise, everyone around stopped. They stopped walking, they stopped talking, and they began looking down at the pavement. We need to be listening for the still, small voice of God. He will tell us when to testify. He will tell us who to testify to, and he will tell us what to say. And it doesn't have to be difficult. Here's another example I want to tell you about. Once around 1900, a man noticed a small boy at the back of a building. The boy was sad because he could not get in to hear a speaker, which was a popular form of entertainment at that time. The man sensed an opportunity, and all he said was, I'll get you in, hold on to my coattail. That's all he said. And the two went into the back door of the theater together. Now, was that a good witnessing plan? Was that the right thing to say? Maybe. The man was D.L. Moody, who was to speak that day. And the boy grew up to be Paul Rader, who much later became one of America's greatest preachers. That day changed that boy's life. That simple act of testifying by Moody, that is the power of God. I'm glad Moody got going on that day. My next example of how easy it is to testify involves a lawyer. Imagine that. In September of 1879, Thomas McFeeters, an attorney, decided he needed to go to the office of a friend of his who was also a lawyer and quite prominent in politics. His friend had been a war hero, an elected legislator, and had also been appointed by President Grant to be the U.S. Attorney for Kansas. Unfortunately, this friend was also becoming an alcoholic. Concerned about his friend, McFeeters entered his friend's office and said, you know, for a long time, I've been wanting to ask you a question that I've been afraid to ask, but now I'm going to ask it. Why in the world are you not a Christian? And then he reached in his pocket and gave a pocket New Testament to his friend. That question spawned a discussion, and not only did his friend accept Jesus as his savior, but he said that his passion for alcohol was immediately taken away. That friend was C.I. Schofield, who later produced the Schofield Reference Bible. My final example comes from the life of the author of a book I found. <clears throat> it's a book entitled 50 People Every Christian Should Know. The author of that book is Warren Wearsby. I hope you've heard of him. He's worked for Youth for Christ, served as the pastor of Moody Church in Chicago, and been the general director of Back to the Bible Radio Broadcast Ministries. His biblical commentaries have sold over four million copies. <clears throat> he recognizes as principal among the factors in his conversion two things, vacation Bible school 
and a simple invitation to attend a Billy Graham rally. Look at this photo. I took it last Sunday as I was leaving my church. These ladies have no idea that they are testifying, but as they teach all those little kids in Vacation Bible School, John 3.16, that is exactly what they will be doing. And among those kids may be another Warren Wearsby, but whether there is or not, many will be saved. You see, one can seize the moment. One can get going without needing to be very knowledgeable, without having a memorized outline, and without having all the answers. Those things are helpful, of course, but it is most helpful to remember that God does all the leading and God provides the words. Some of the words he has already provided are in John 3.16. Those are great words all by themselves. On the day my wife and I landed at Love Field to attend this very meeting, my wife had asked the Lord to show her someone who needed him in their, in their life. And as we tried to find the shuttle stop, an airport employee saw us wandering around cluelessly and asked if he could help us. We told him what we were looking for, and he said, follow me. On the way, Cindy merely said, has anyone ever told you about Jesus? He said, no. And then he said that he knew he needed to be better and to go to church more. Then she said, can I tell you what the Bible says about how you can be sure you'll go to heaven? And he stopped dead in his tracks and he said, yes. Yes, you can. Tell me. It took Cindy just a few moments to explain how he could receive eternal life. He wanted to pray right then in that parking building and, to, and, and do all of that. He was so anxious to do it that he had no self-consciousness at all about doing it in public under the scrutiny of others walking by. His prayer was so sweet and so well worded. His apology to God was heartfelt and so was his appreciation. When he lifted his head, the first thing he said was, I am so happy. I feel so much better. He thanked us several times and then he shouted as he departed, I love you people. So to sum up, we just have to disrupt the norm and be available. We have to be able to act. We have to get free. We have to advance the gospel. We have to get focused on our mission of evangelism. We, go ahead. I hope you agree with me. We have to do this. And we have to have an active relationship with the Lord, one that lets him set the timing, one that listens for his instruction, and one that depends on him to choose the words. And then we have to do our part. We have to obey him by seizing the moment or the opportunity will disappear. We have to get going. We have to testify. Pray with me. Lord, as it says in the Psalms, may we cultivate faithfulness in our land. Help us as Southern Baptists to open our mouths and boldly share the gospel. Mr. President, that includes the Executive Committee's report about where we are, who we are, and where we should go. Thank you, Augie, for your report.